I have a very distinguished panel with me today. On my left, I have Ann Collier, who is the co-director of blogsafely.com, which is soon to be rebranded as connectsafely.org. She's also the executive director and editor of netfamilynews.org. And then to my left, I have, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Anne's to my right. <laughs> and to my left, I have Jeremy Rawson, who is vice president and general counsel of Helio. And then to uh, Jeremy's left, we have Mark Jacobstein, who is the executive vice president of corporate development for Looped. He was formerly the president and co-founder of Digital Chocolate. And he also is, was a former founder and CEO of Small World Sports, which was later sold to the Sporting News, right? Um, and then on the far left, I have um, Patrick Haley, who is the Government Affairs Director for the National Emergency Number Association. He is responsible for responding, representing the, the association with the FCC, other federal agencies, and other organizations. He manages all policy for the association. So we have a very interesting panel today. I promise it will be a very interesting discussion. And we're going to kick it off with just a basic discussion about what social mapping is and what it means. And for that, I will start with Anne. Good morning. I think um, Larry gave sort of a feel for um, the technological context. And let me sort of give you a little bit of a feel for the sociological context of, of what we're looking at right now. Um, what helped me was to read in the Wall Street Journal that two thirds of phones, cell phones, sold in the US this year Will, have, will be GPS enabled. Um, so that's not the entire installed base, but it's, it's a big chunk um, and, and growing. The genie is out of the bottle. Um, a recent Liz Claiborne sponsored study on dating abuse found that 71% of US 13 to 18 year olds, these are teenagers, see spreading rumors by phone or the web as a serious problem. Um, a quarter of them a quarter of teens in a relationship communicated with their partner via cell phone or texting hourly between midnight and 5 a.m. 30 percent, almost a third, say that they um, are text messaged 10, 20, or 30 times an hour by a partner inquiring where they are, what they're doing, or who they're with. So GPS will help them pinpoint each other more often, they won't even have to talk to each other. Two thirds of parents whose teens were checked on up to 30 times a day on their cell phone were unaware this was happening. A quarter of teens say they've been bullied or harassed by their partner through cell phones and texting. So there's a peer to peer element here um, that parents need to think about. We all need to sort of put on our parent hats. Parents use GPS-enabled ki kid phones to keep track of their kids. Larry spoke to that very briefly. Um, another really positive application is a kind of cyber escort service that's being tested at um, a university in California that sends a message to campus security when a, a student is walking to his or her dorm at night by him or herself. Um, and then security can pinpoint them if they don't reach their location at a certain time and security knows what that location is. So um, there are many really positive uses and there are many social, social uses, the actual ways that GPS and, and triangulation and all these technologies are used are many and the services are phenomenal. There's Looped, Helio, Jaxter, Twitter, Socialite, Dodgeball, Slam. A librarian somewhere in the US blogged a list of, um, a 13 page list of services available right now. Um, this, is, this is one of the pages and there are 13 services on that page. So there are a whole lot of these services available, some of them in beta obviously, but I couldn't possibly list them all. And what, are they, what do people do with these services? Well, media sharing is huge. 70% of US and European teenagers share content, cell phone users, share content via their phones, and most of it is photo sharing. So, and Italian teens are number one in this area. They love photo sharing on their cell phones. It's huge in Asia and Europe, you know. We're way behind those two areas. Some of the other uses of these services, group bulletins about real-time location for meetups, group chat or texting, many-to-many, one-to-many, however you wanna cut it, phone enabling your profile 
in a social website. That's what Jackster does, so that people can call you from your profile. Um, mobile social media sharing I touched on. Mobile sticky notes while you travel. Real-time mobile blogging. That's a little bit what Twitter is, only it's little short messages. And, and Twitter also you, um, en enables family members to track each other throughout the day. Or when mom is on a, on a business trip, she can find out what her kids are up to and vice versa and where they are. So on the safety side of this, a major fundamental for safe mobile socializing is that phones are used as tools for existing social networks. That's the key for keeping in touch with friends they know in real life, not for reaching out. And I think that might become the basis of kind of a best practices um, document that eventually is worked out, possibly. Safety education will need to establish that this is a different tool from web-based social networking, not as public, not a very visible popularity contest or online identity. A certain amount of performance is involved, but it's not as visual. It's not summed up in a page on the web for all to see. So this is a, a different kind of tool. It's more private, more intimate. Um, you can be pinpointed physically, but hopefully just with people you know. The pioneer anthropologists of this space, the researchers that are just beginning to emerge, there's one at, at Penn at the Annenberg School, are saying early adopters of mobile social networking have two purposes, or two uses for it, social performance and social functionality. They're not just sort of giving info, but they're also giving off info about themselves. So what does my using this technology and telling you where I am tell you about me. I'm an A-lister. I'm a hyper-communicator. I'm highly social. I know where stuff is. So there's an element of performance in this, but it's not as visual and not as public. Thank you, Ian. That, that was actually a very, very good overview. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Mark to talk about what social mapping means from Loop's perspective. Sure. Um, so a few things. It's, it, I'm not surprised um, Anne was able to find 13 pages of 13 um, names each of folks in this space. Um, there are probably hundreds more that are not on that list. Um, and, and I'd like to touch very briefly on why are there hundreds of companies trying to do what, what we call social mapping. The, the simplest answer to that is the most common question in the world, um, the most common text message people send, and, and we're almost certain the most common voice call that people make is where are you? It is the most essential piece of social context, and for that matter, it's probably the most important piece of commercial context um, that is not already readily available to people. Um, if you think about cell phones, what cell phones have done historically is they have extended your ability to talk and hear to essentially infinite distances. Social mapping services essentially extend your ability to see. They extend your ability to know where your friends are or where your colleagues are or where your child is in a way that can be profoundly important um, and has, has tremendous social value, um, also has tremendous uh, uh, unintended uh, consequences if not handled properly. So um, my perspective on this, Loop, Looped is one of the, the first social mapping services um, to actually get commercially deployed. There's really only two that are commercially deployed in the U.S., Looped vis-a-vis -vis Boost Mobile um, and uh, a, a service by Ulocate that's, that's launched with, uh, with Helio. And what we have tried to do and, and what the folks of, at Helio have tried to do is essentially is solve this problem of, of where are you. And to Anne's earlier point, I think the essential thing to understand what people like to lump mobile social networking and social mapping together, and I, social networking as a phenomenon on the web, so many, many good things, many bad things, what much of it is about is, about is reaching out to people you don't know. Tom of MySpace has 140 million friends, and Tila Tequila has 2 million friends. Um, I, I would like to think that on Looped um, or on any social mapping service, you probably ought to have 20 or 30 friends. You really shouldn't be sharing your location with anybody who's not already in your phone book, with uh, anybody who's not uh, without whom you already have a pre-established relationship. And, and these are some of the things that I think we'll get into later in the best practices uh, panel. But um, just want to touch on a few other things, and, and Anne mentioned some of these. But social mapping for us is where are your friends? Where is the pizza place? Um, 
I like this pizza place, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 and I'm going to share that with my friend. It's, it is t essentially attaching lo location and proximity information and, uh, to various things you use in social context um, and, then, and then sharing that it hopefully in a very, very private way. Um, we, a couple other features that are in Looped and in some of our competitors that I think people should think about. Proximity-based messaging. So rather than sending a text message to all of my friends or to a specific friend uh, with a service like Loop, I can send a message to people, but only people within a half mile of me or only people within one mile of me, which, as you might imagine, in a social context is very powerful. Frankly, it's also very powerful in an emergency context. It's very powerful with, um, in, in potential healthcare situations. Um, one other thing, and while I'm speaking about healthcare, that, that we do in a social context is geofencing. So I get an alert if a friend of mine comes within a certain distance, and I can set those alerts up. So I can say, I want to know whenever Bill is within a half mile of me, or I want to know whenever Joe comes within three miles of me. I call it the sort of enhanced serendipity feature of Looped. Turns out, I, you have friends near you all of the time and you don't actually realize it. Um, we'd like to think this is going to increase actually face-to-face -face communication and, and, and real community as opposed to virtual community. It's one of the reasons we really like it. But there's all sorts of geofencing applications outside of the social realm. Again, there are healthcare applications, there are emergency situations, um, but there are of course also ways in which geofencing can be used in ways that are intrusive, um, or violate uh, um, people's sense of privacy. Um, uh, there are all sorts of uh, um, uh, law enforcement issues that come up as a result. So we'll touch more on those. Thank you, Mark. And now I'll turn it to Jeremy to answer the question. What else is left? Um, <laughs> Helio. You know, yeah. Yes. Well, well, Helio's kind of main premise is, is uh, keeping our members connected to their friends. Um, that's kind of our underlying, you know, what we're all about. So it includes traditional communication, uh, voice, text, email, but also includes, you know, uh, social networking sites. We have an uh, integration with MySpace. Um, sharing content, uh, Anne was touching on that earlier, that sharing content is huge, big, big, big. Mm -hmm. That's what we're all about, sharing. You know, you hear a really amazing song, you want to share it with your friends, make sure everybody gets it. Uh, you can send it out um, uh, and give it to them. Um, we also do local search, as, uh, as Larry was mentioning. Unfortunately, I've used this too often, but uh, typing in pizza in Google Maps, which we've got integrated with GPS, will show you the pizza restaurants right around where you're at. Um, you know, we also have, as, as Larry also was touching on, we have photo tagging, a GPS photo tagging. Um, so you can go to a concert, and you can take a picture, and, and if your friends go back to that same venue, uh, you're at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles, you go see... Uh, dating myself, but Neil Diamond or something like that. Um, no. And uh, sorry. Um, and your friends go to that same venue, they can see the photos you've taken at that venue. It'll pop up with all of your friends' photos from that venue. Um, there are a bunch of different applications of sharing uh, content with friends. Um, and that's really what's underlying all of this. And again, I think uh, Mark touched on it, you know, with that inherent. Um, with, with the power of location comes uh, inherent um, privacy issues that we have to tackle, and each of us tackle in different ways. And again, we'll go into that in best practices. Uh, Mark has a, a way of doing it at Looped. We have a way of doing it at Helio. Um, but that, that basically is it. I, I just think you know our whole premise is keeping connected to friends and sharing content, sharing you know everything about who you are. Uh, with limitation. So uh, you, you all have really touched on this, but let's spend a little more time talking about the unique concerns from the perspective of safety. Let's start with safety, and then we'll go to privacy. But just from the perspective of safety, the unique concerns that arise in the wireless environment, and I'll turn it over to you, Anne, to talk about that. Well, as I said before, I think that the most important thing is the closed network concept um, for to um, educate from the industry and from us in advocacy to educate the public to promote in-network communication um, with people that young people know in real life. Um, the problem with this is it doesn't reach the, the you know the cyber stalkers, the people that 
kids maybe have been dating, who, you know, like a relationship gone bad. It doesn't cover um, domestic abuse and issues involving people you know. And that's something that maybe we're all going to have to unite together to address. Um, but at least we can take care of the predation element, which is the great fear in the social networking space. And to be fair, Mark, you, you spoke about the difference. I, we probably should be a little more granular about social networking in that the vast majority of teenagers really just use it to communicate with their peers. So, and, and the Pew Internet and American Life Project has just brought that out. So, and when they turn on privacy features, they're just talking among themselves. They're really trying to keep private um, from, you know, strangers as well as parents, of course. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of good stuff going on, and, and those safety practices that teens are already using need to be moved into this, this other space. And and then now I'll turn it again back to, to Mark to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the types of things that that you worry about and that Looped worries about and the things, and again, we'll get into this in more detail in the best practices discussion, but here let's just touch on some of the things that you've anticipated in advance and what you've done to address them. Yeah, so so there's there's really three things that, that keep me up at night, um, and, and uh, well, there's many things that keep me up at night, but uh, the, the, the three primary concerns I have at Looped, um, from a safety and privacy perspective, I can lump them into stalking, um, predation, and I'll talk about how I think of that differently than stalking, and the third would be Big Brother, and, and for us Big Brother doesn't just mean the, the threat of, of privacy leaks, say, to the government, but privacy leaks <coughs> to the Internet writ large, to um, corporations, et cetera. Um, and one of the most interesting challenges for a company like ours is that on occasion, privacy concerns and safety concerns bump up against each other, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So. Um, and, and maybe uh, leave most of the discussion to how we try to solve these to the best practices panel, but I will say this. So for us, what stalking is about is somebody trying to get a service like Looped onto somebody else's phone unwittingly um, and have that and know where that person is without that person having given permission. So every service like ours, um, including the irresponsible ones, they're always going to be permission-based. But the question is whether or not um, the, the fact that they're permission-based is enough. The, whether or not the consumer, whether or not it's too easy for somebody to get a service onto somebody else's device and then have basically a homing beacon on them. And I'll tell you, I worry about this an awful lot because if you type in stalking on Google, if anybody's got a laptop right now, you can go do it, you will find thousands and thousands of sites where you can go and buy all sorts of devices to stalk people. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, and, but what it reflects, frankly, is that the desire to do this is out there. Um, and so we've gone to great, great lengths and talk more about it to prevent that. The, the second thing I mentioned was predation. Um, I, I, I think of predation different from stalking in that I think of predation more in terms of uh, adult, child, um, inappropriate, uh, both in terms of age, but also quite often somebody who doesn't know the other person um, is trying to establish a relationship, tries to groom them, tries to, in, a, in, in there are, again, we've all seen the, the 2020s, there are a lot of creeps out there, um, enormous number, and preventing uh, contact between two folks who don't already know each other or shouldn't know each other is, again, a really essential part of what services like ours ought to be doing. And, you know, unclear whether we can make the world uh, completely safe as far as these things go. Um, there are bad people out there, as Larry pointed out earlier. Um, technology is, is, in many ways, is neutral. But I think there is a responsibility for providers like us to do more than just launch the service and say, well, you know, bad people will do bad things. That's, it's not enough. Um, and, and the third concern here is, is Big Brother. Um, we all saw last year when AOL released um, hundreds of thousands of search records to the public and thought that they'd done a decent job of, of scrubbing private information from those, from those records, and in fact, they hadn't, and, uh, and all sorts of tremendously private information was revealed. Um, we saw it recently. Social security numbers have been sitting on some government websites for years. Um, it happens all constantly. Data leakage is an enormous problem, and I, I know um, Jim Dempsey is going to talk later about some of the, the um, you know, customer privacy and consumer privacy issues related to this. 
But for us, what that means, and I will discuss this one best practice very briefly, we don't store historical location information. The moment we know where one of our customers is, we erase the last location we had for that person. Because A, I don't have any interest in answering a subpoena from some divorce lawyer to, who wants to know where uh, his customer's, uh, uh, his, his client's wife was three weeks ago. But B, the chance of either a social hack or a physical hack or somebody getting into a co-location facility. This location information is about the most sensitive PII that exists. And if you don't encrypt it and you don't delete it the moment you don't need it and you don't treat it with the utmost care, <clears throat> it will be a disaster. So th those, are the, those are really the three issues that we think about, stalking, predation, and Big Brother, when, when we spend all this time and effort making sure that, um, that our, our service is safe. And Mark, that last point is actually a very good segue into our next um, discussion, which will be about law enforcement access to location information. And uh, we, again, we won't spend time on it here, but suffice to say that um, you know it certainly um, creates, I think, some difficulty on both sides of the fence when law enforcement wants carriers and um, LBS providers to retain the data. But you know, to the points you made, uh, you know, it's not always a feasible thing to do, and it's not always the right thing to do from a privacy perspective. But I know in the next panel we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so. Now I'll turn it over quickly to you, Jeremy, to um, talk about what keeps you up at night and the types of things that uh, Helio has done to address it. Um, Mark, I think, summarized the kind of the three overarching uh, ideas. Um, I think, you know, for me, I'm also a lawyer, so I've got to deal with the state and federal regs uh, as well. So, uh, so that keeps me up as night, <laughs> at night as well. Um, you know what Helio does in our application because we are uh, because we are really concerned about location information and its implications is we don't provide for what we call true tracking. You can't just look on your device and be able to say, "Oh, this is where that person is." What we do is is anytime somebody wants, so first of all, you've got to sign up permission based, and again, we'll go into this uh, later, or Mark will uh, on a later panel. But it's permission-based. You actually have to download an application, agree to its terms, all that fun stuff uh, on the front end. Um, as Mark said, you can do that and then just drop the device in your wife or your child's uh, bag and then be able to track them. Uh, but what we do is actually we add another feature where any time a friend, so let's say I would like to uh, track Mark, I actually send a, a, an email where I try to update his location. There is a message that then fills up his entire screen that says, Mark wants to track you, are you okay with that? Um, so each time you are updated, there is an actual, you have to positively, you have to affirmatively answer. Uh, if you say no, it will not update your location. Uh, you can also at any time cloak yourself. So uh, if you remember Star Trek, again, <laughs> dating myself, uh, the Klingons were able to cloak their ships and you wouldn't be able to see them come up. You can cloak yourself at any time and nobody will know, be able to track you. You can also add and remove friends at will. Um, so we've built in those kind of uh, protections so that you know, there is a lot of active uh, participation and affirmative participation by the person being tracked. If uh, I could just quick jump in, that, that's really important. Those types of flashing, frequent reminders are really important where adolescents are concerned because as you all probably already know, teenagers haven't yet developed their frontal lobes, the executive part of their brains that tell them about the implications of their actions or actually flash those mes messages automatically the way they do for adults. So that's the kind of feature that young people need for protection um, in, in mobile social networking. Yeah, and we learned a little bit of a lesson. We have a, one of our parents is SK Telecom, and those who, of you who don't know, SK Telecom is about a 51% market share in Korea. Uh, and uh, as many of you know, Korea is well ahead of the United States in their wireless technology. Um, and they had a pretty bad situation with a lot of what Mark was talking about, where uh, husbands were tracking wives, wives were tracking husbands, and it got to be a, a lot of complaints. No lawsuits, because their legal system isn't quite like ours. Um, and as litigious as ours. Um, but what you had was you have now have a feature in Korea where anytime you are being tracked, it tell, there is an alert that comes up and says, you know, Mark is tracking you or whoever's tracking you. Uh, it's a one-time alert, so at that time you can cloak yourself. It's not affirmative like we are. So they are actually, in fact, being tracked. You will be able to see their location. 
but you can easily turn it off. With us, you actually, there is no update until the there is affirmative. So it's basically an opt-out as opposed to an opt-in. Correct. Right. Um, opt out per time, yeah. Right, okay. Um, and I don't mean to, I know we're starting to run short on time. I want to now turn this discussion over to Patrick for a bit to talk about, we've talked a little bit about the, the implications from a privacy and a safety perspective and certainly the concerns that arise um, in this environment. But I do want to talk a little bit about the beneficial uses um, from a societal perspective. And Patrick, I think you can weigh in on how location-based services have helped public safety and where you see this going in the next few years. Sure. Uh, this is sort of a new topic for me, the concept of social mapping, and it's interesting, and I do think there's a lot of public safety value here to the technology that's being developed. It's funny, so yesterday I was sort of learning a little bit more about this technology and what is it, and I get home and I have a, a flyer from WMATA, the Washington Metro Transit Authority, and it's basically you know, register what bus line you use, and when the bus is near you, we'll send you a text message. It's like, wow, all right, these guys are serious. This stuff is really starting to happen. And now I'm listening to you talk about uh, child finders, and I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be rough for kids because somehow my mom knew where I was every time, no matter what, just on her natural instinct. Watch you out, know? kids. I remember one time I uh, snuck out with a buddy, and uh, we oh. went over to some, some girl's house, you know, and I, the phone rings. My mom doesn't even know who this person is. It's your mom. What? <laughs> you know, because she just, you know, hit redial. These people, moms are smart. So this is scary if you're a teenager. Um, but in terms of public safety, uh, we talked about the most common question, where are you? I mean, that is the most common question. That's probably the first thing we ask, other than is, is this a police fire EMS type emergency? Um, so location is, is critical. Um, and a couple of things I, I think I can talk about here, and one is, Public safety traditionally lag, lags behind in terms of technology from what the rest of the economy is using. And um, it seems to me that there are some serious potential tools that could be in the hands of public safety that aren't necessarily being developed for public safety. Um, for example, and, and maybe there's some positive unintended consequences for what these gentlemen are, are developing technologically. Um, people need to know where assets are in the field. People need to know where police officers are in the field, where firefighters are in the field. Where firefighters are in a, in a particular response can be helpful so that you know when to get somebody um, you know, over here and when to get somebody out of here because the building's about to collapse. So, but I don't think public safety typically necessarily thinks about this kind of technology as something that's beneficial to them because it's just not on their radar. But to the extent that we can benefit from commercial applications, and I think that's something public safety is getting smarter about, is, is what, what else is being developed out there that we can use to our benefit that's not going to be specifically designed just for me that's going to cost me a million dollars. Um, so one, I think we can benefit and use these technologies as tools for emergency responders. Um, Second is the issue of, of location in general. Um, these services are only useful, I, I imagine, if the actual location is right. If you know your friends really are where you say you are, or the pizza parlor really is where, where you say it is on the map. Um, so to the extent that technology is developing that improves the ability to locate individuals, or devices, I guess I should say, um, hopefully those technologies are also being developed with 911 particularly in, cons in consideration because location is the most important thing for any 911 call is being able to accurately find somebody. Um, and so I remember, must have been what, seven years ago where everyone kept talking about the location-based services market and we're going to have all these messages being sent to me on cell phones and we got fairly excited from a 911 perspective because we figure that technology will drive improvements in location technology to accurately locate for a commercial reason a device. So. I'm happy to hear that services like this are being developed because I hope it will spur industry into continuing to develop location technologies. Um, uh, Larry uh, the, mentioned the uh, fact that there's all these different technologies out there for locating people. And that's true. And that's a challenge for 911. And so we started, as, as you said, with wireline. I mean, you weren't moving your house anywhere, and you weren't going to move a payphone anywhere. These were fixed. Uh, services. And then you have wireless, and there's a couple different flavors of how you locate a wireless phone. And we figured out how to automatically locate a wireless phone as accurately as we can, and then send that onto the 911 center, assuming that they have the technology to actually receive it, like you were talking about. 
And now we have a whole bunch of other things. Wi-Fi networks, Wi-Max networks, municipal Wi-Fi networks, combination of wi traditional wireless and Wi-Fi networks, all these new technologies which are being developed and they have value in terms of the services that you're talking about. But how do we locate the person first of all? And secondly, how do we share that location with 911? perfect example of that is, even when a, in a fixed situation, the current voice over IP technology, um, there's no automatic location for your voice over IP technology. If you're using a Vonage phone or something like that, when you dial 911, it's not automatically located, like it is with a wireline phone or a wireless phone. You have to self-register. And I know the wireless industry is now in this business of, okay, well, we're going to be offering IP services. How are we going to locate these phones automatically, and how are we going to share it with 911? That's a question, you know, people are working on that issue. But as it stands, it's a self-registration location. And that's difficult for 911, because sometimes it can be accurate. You can move, forget to register your new location. So as we sort of look at these, this, this general phenomenon of location services, whether it be for a commercial purpose or for a 911 public safety service, we need to think about, in an emergency situation, when we do want to be located, how do we effectively uh, share that information with, uh, with public safety? And, and Patrick, I'm just going to quickly, I want to quickly tie in what you just said, which is very, very useful for us to know, with this idea of, of social networking and how it does or does not tie into your, you know, the public safety needs and whether there could be situations in which social networking could in fact help. And I'll, I'll throw out an example and you can weigh in on it. Um, obviously we all know about this horrible um, incident at Virginia Tech. Um, horrific incident. Um, there's been some speculation that um, had the students at Virginia Tech been able to better communicate with each other instead of relying on the university that things might have been avoided. Um, perhaps they could have used some of these services to be able to do that. Is that something that public safety has thought about yet? Um, is it too far on the horizon for, for public safety to think about? I Are would, there ways that you can use it? I would say by and large Generally, I don't think they've thought about this type of technology right. application for an emergency response, mm -hmm. but we've thought about the technology, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about proximity-based text messaging. Obviously, in a situation like that, if we can, if, whether it's the 911 center or whether it's the university, if we can target a specific area of individuals, we don't want to scare the entire town. Mm -hmm. Right. We just want to, look to let people in the vicinity know. And so if, if we can do that via wireless text messaging, that's definitely a benefit for you know, getting people out of a dangerous situation. The flip side of that, though, is um, the ability to text message back into the 911 system. This, again, goes to new technologies. We can't receive a text message. Um, so I think one of the keys here, when I, when I hear about these really sort of cutting edge technologies, is managing public expectations. I love watching the show CSI. It's my wife's favorite show. And it's amazing what these people can do. They're, they have these screens that pop up out of nowhere and they're pushing buttons and they know where everybody is and it's, this is not what a 911 center looks like. I mean, there's telephones, some of them have electronic maps, some of them don't. So, the, I, and we have a society coming up of, what, that are using technology like this and they can, they can track their friends, they know where their friends are, they can send text messages, they can do all these things, instant message. 911 is not there. So as we develop these new technologies, and while there may be interesting capabilities, the 911 system needs to get up to speed mm -hmm. technologically so that we can actually take advantage of technologies that are developing like this, because right now we're definitely behind the curve. Mm -hmm. very, very good point. I'm sorry. Did you want to make a Well, I, I was just thinking that um, there's an opportunity here for public safety and industry and advocacy to work together. Um, last year we saw a perfect storm of public concern development on the on the web with social networking and you know the technology came out of nowhere in terms of what parents awareness was exponential growth for myspace huge very negative media coverage and a midterm election so perfect storms increasingly put kids at risk i don't think people realize that when you generate talk about managing public expectations when you generate tremendous fear um, communication goes down, especially within the home when teenagers are involved. When you start banning things, for example, if all the focus is on one social networking service and it's demonized,
kids can go underground so easily with so many devices and so many hot spots and so many workarounds that um, parents the focus is in the wrong place, and there are so many irresponsible businesses in, in, within any industry where kids can go, um, where stalkers, predators, adults can go too with bad intentions. So it's really important to rationalize the discussion and try to avoid a perfect storm in this space, I think. Mm -hmm. Great, great Hi. points. Go ahead, yeah. Mark. I just wanted to mention one other, one other thing, actually, um, to Patrick's point about, about positive um, uses of these services beyond sort of a general social realm. Emergency services, um, people typically think of emergency services in things like the Virginia Tech shooting. Most of what emergency services is about actually is responding, uh, quite a bit of what it's about is responding to people who are in some sort of health care crisis. So I have a good friend who's an EMS consultant who works with diabetics. It's a tremendous problem in this country, 10 or 20 million diabetics. Um, most of them um, have to take care of themselves, and most of them do a pretty good job of regulating their insulin and checking their insulin levels and that sort of thing most of the time. When they don't is when they're away from their routine. They don't check their insulin levels when they're not at home, when they're not at work, when they're, on, when they're on vacation or they're away from their routines is when they get into trouble. And so one of the interesting uses of a service like this <clears throat> is geofencing for basically for, for self-regulation of your own medical condition. So if I sent you a text message every day saying, hey, have you checked your insulin levels, eventually you're going to turn, tune it out and you're going to ignore it. But if you only get that text message when you're not at home or you're not at work or you're not at school, you're outside of the beaten path, it actually is the kind of thing, oh, right, I'm on vacation, I'd forgotten to check my insulin levels, and it becomes this tremendously powerful prophylactic tool. Um, I think. And that's one idea that one friend of mine came up with when he first encountered our service. I, I think that there are dozens and dozens of these that nobody's dreamt up yet because, frankly, the services are so new. Um, but I, I think we're going to see more and more uses like that uh, in the near future. There's one other um, item I think that uh, should be brought up, and I, I'm sure my friend at Verizon knows this all too well. Um, but the FBI or DEA. Uh, often try to get location from us uh, with respect to different potential criminals. Uh, so, I mean, that's another way, another use for it. Um, interesting to navigate those waters with subpoenas and all these other things, but uh, that's another uh, real big use for this types of, type of technology. Can I add one thing? Um, you said you do a Google for search for pizza yeah. and you get all these things. It would be nice if the uh, fire responder on the scene could do a Google search for hazmat. Yeah. And have all the buildings in the in their adjoining area show. Oh yeah, well here's where triple ethyl methyl death is, and here's where whatever mm -hmm. is. You know, so you, again, it's the same technology. It's just using it for a different purpose. And the other thing is, you talked about you're concerned about Big Brother. I think everybody's concerned about Big Brother. I always wonder why we have this negative image of Big Brother. Maybe Big Brother's good sometimes. Um, usually not, I, I guess. But uh, for example, avian flu. Um, if you find out somebody has has brought this disease into the United States and you don't find out until 30 days later, it might be a good thing to be able to know where this person has been mm -hmm. and who else has been in the same area. So while we have these serious concerns about privacy and we don't want anyone to know anything, true, but let's not, let's not eliminate positive uses of that location information at the same time. So actually I just want to mention somebody just launched a Google Maps mashup where you can go and, and register that you are sick and you are here. Um, and you don't have to put your name, you don't have to put in any identifying information, but you say, I've got the flu and here I am. And if people start using this, what will actually happen is sort of a self-created version of that map that they used to, to, I don't remember what outbreak it was, but typhus maybe in the 1860s, they, they figured out it was all because of this one handle at the well and they removed the handle on the well and they saved thousands of lives. Um, I, I think that um, that's an, an example to Patrick's point of, of a service like this using location that has tremendously positive social aspect and actually done in a way that respects consumer privacy. So you, I, I think hopefully these things can be done and um, without violating consumer privacy but still providing the value that uh, the people are looking for. And actually that, that's a good segue into uh, another topic I think we should touch on briefly today. We're running a little short on time but we'll try to cover it. Um, and the issue of 
the current regulatory environment with respect to privacy. Again, I know this will be discussed in the later best practices panel, so we won't go into a lot of detail here. But um, suffice it to say that the current regulatory environment is a bit uh, muddied <laughs> um, in terms of, uh, of the notice and consent regimes um, that should be used by carriers and location-based service providers. Um, certainly, um, the carriers and the LBS providers have developed their own notice and consent regimes over the years. There are a lot of different flavors of these regimes. There are a lot of different mechanisms for providing notice and for obtaining consent. Um, in the U.S., it is, um, as, as Jeremy said, it is pretty much all opt-in, so there's no, um, I think I can say that safely, that you know, there, I don't believe there are any services that would default to allowing a, a user to be tracked without prior affirmative consent. But how that consent is obtained and how the notice is delivered and so forth does vary according to the business model. A lot of it does depend on operational issues, um, you know, the feasibility of, of the technology or the feasibility of, of, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but the feasibility of, of having a notice on a small wireless um, device. So I want to talk about that a little bit. I think that's a very important part of this discussion um, because it is very important from the privacy perspective. So I'll turn, again, I'll turn it over, I guess, first to you. No, you don't, okay. I can't speak to <laughs> no, Okay, I don't want to talk. Um, I'll turn it, I, I'm just focusing on you guys right now, but um, I'll turn it back over to both of you to briefly talk about um, how do you structure notice when you are dealing with, uh, you know, a small device? How do you make sure a notice is clear and conspicuous? Um, how do you make sure that the, the consent is, is robust, et cetera? And I'll start with you, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I think, uh, sometimes notice on a device is actually better than notice on the internet where you're scrolling through the I accept button. Um, with a device, I mean, we, you can force the issue. Uh, and I think, you know, and I, I talked about it earlier, we do force the issue. We basically take up your screen, your entire screen with an alert that says, hey, do you want this person to track you? Um, so I, I actually think, um, you know, the screen size actually doesn't really matter as long as you are clear in terms of what you're trying to get at. I mean, we, we do have the, you know, standard boilerplate that, that you opt into and you accept the first time, but the notice on the screen, actually, I think it's actually better on a device than you, you have on the, on the Internet. I, I couldn't agree more. The, the interesting thing is, well, this device is not as good for reading a 17-page term of use or <laughs> privacy policy. No one ever reads them anyway. People, unfortunately, they don't read those anyways. Um, what, what really is relevant to, to uh, Jeremy's point here are, are the uh, specific consents around sharing of location information. There's, in fact, well, it's interesting. Last March, we got a verbal yes to launch our service with Boost Mobile, which is part of Sprint Nextel. It was then six months later that we actually launched our service. Um, and the reason was we spent six months uh, with our, our good and very expensive friends at Wilson Sonsini and the <laughs> folks at Sprint Nextel hammering through these issues because it had never been done before. And frankly, the case law around what is appropriate consent on a handset is somewhat, um, it's thin to say the least. Um, so you're, you're using a analogies from other systems. The, the, the most important thing, though, to, to Jeremy's point here is forget about whether or not you got your I's dotted and your T's crossed. Did you, did you get the appropriate consents in a very obvious way with your customer, and do you have clear and conspicuous and continuous display to the customer that they're using a service where their location is, is turned on, and do you make it incredibly easy for them to turn that off? So, you know, while I'm happy we spent all this time and money crafting our terms of use and privacy policy, frankly, what I'm happier about is that every single time you accept a friendship request in our, in our service, you basically get hit over the head with a note, like, is this person really a good friend? Would you share your keys with this person? Would you, would you let this person in your house? That's that kind of um, sort of continuous reminder of the seriousness of sharing location is really <clears throat> the most important point. Um, and then there's other legal, you know, terms of art. You, you, you use a return, you know, the person has to be able to, to turn off the service at any time and to stop getting billed for it. And, and um, uh, you know, within our registration process, it's probably the most onerous registration process I've ever seen. Um, you have to actually actively and affirmatively assent to seven different things um, in our reg process. It probably takes 15 minutes to get through. but. Consumer knows what they're getting by the time they're done with it. And by the way, 
Um, the marketing hat on me would say, ah, I wish it was, it was thinner, it was easier to get through, but it, no. It, consumers need to be aware, especially with a new service um, of, of this sort, of exactly what they're getting into, and you need very straightforward, clear, obvious language, and people need to keep getting reminded of it. And frankly, the power of the service is so great that consumers will get past it. Where, where are you is such an incredibly important question. I, if there's one thing I want people to take away from this is social mapping is not a fad. It is not a pet rock. It is not something that people are going to use for three minutes or, or and because some of the companies have arguably somewhat silly names like Looped. Um, this, this, this is a service that is, is not just for 15-year-olds. There is not a 60-year-old alive who doesn't have a few people that they know that they want to know where they are. You want to know where your spouse is because maybe they can pick up diapers. You want to know where your kids are. They, I mean, my 39-year-old sister is a mother of three, desperately wants Loop to be available on her provider, Verizon, um, uh, <laughs> it, uh, as, as soon as possible because she wants to know where my brother-in-law, who's an ER doc, is he still at the hospital or is he near the grocery store right now so he can pick up some diapers? This is, I mean, this is a really, really powerful concept. It is, it is not a fad. It's not just something for teens. It's not going away. And so and to, to Anne's earlier point, we got to make sure we get this right now, before they become widespread and before you have the, frankly, the sort of the fiasco you saw around some of the social networks, for a variety of the reasons that Anne outlined and, well, and people and are here today. To your point, Mark, seven specific explicit consents is a really good thing, you know, in, in the context of that desperate uptake because you know, if you look at, you know, free accounts everywhere on the web, Hotmail, you name it, um, all the social networks, you can establish a social networking profile within five minutes. I mean, it's, yeah, you can spend hours decorating it, but it's <laughs> really quick and very easy. And there are hundreds and hundreds of social networking sites. So, and there are no barriers like that. Mm -hmm. So barriers are good especially with teenagers. And so that's something to think about in the next panel, I think. Yeah, and I think um, that is something that makes, again, that makes probably wireless unique. Um, because you do have rules in place and because the wireless industry traditionally has been very conservative on these issues um, and so has not only followed the rules but also has, has taken its own initiative to do things the right way. I think, yeah. um, you know, that's a distinguishing factor when you're, when you're dealing with a wireless uh, device, um, you're probably not going to have to worry quite so much about the, the privacy um, issues as you would in an environment. It's a great point. I, I think th there's, there's two things um, that the wireless industry has provided that are very important as far as these services are concerned. One is, by the very, its very nature, the wireless industry is fairly conservative, and, and location, location APIs are privileged. You can't be three kids in a, in a room and just go um, Start, start an application, put it out uh, for anybody to use, and start accessing live location off handsets. There are one or two tiny exceptions to that, but basically 99% of the handsets in this country have locked down uh, location APIs. And that's incredibly important because what it's meant is the only services that are out there like ours or like Helios are ones that have gone through this very rigorous vetting process to make sure they really are safe and private. Um, I get very concerned with the fact that there are lots of new location technologies coming along, Larry outlined them, um, that are going to be not necessarily controlled by the wireless operators. And mm -hmm. as a result, irresponsible services, if there isn't a really well understood set of best practices that, that three kids in a garage can use before they go and launch a service, um, I think you're going to see irresponsible services perhaps unintentionally irresponsible services out there if we don't do a good job of making sure that location remains either a privileged API or that people at least really understand what the issues are before they go building services. And, and I'll just say that's a very good segue into our very last but quick point um, that we wanted, wanted to make sure we covered before we open it up to Q&A, which is the, you know, like you just said, the business models that operate outside of the privileged API so, for example, advertising supported business models whereby um, someone can get the service free because it's supported by third party ads that are generated on the handset. So, I, I do want to spend maybe three minutes uh, talking about that and then we will turn it over to uh, QA. So, did you have a comment you wanted to make about that first? Or? I would just reiterate what you and Mark said that it's, it, you know, best practice is pretty much 
you know, need to be established before the services become completely untethered from family plans where parents lose even more control? Yeah, there's, Jeremy, there's, did you, want to you know, I, I can touch on that in a second. I actually wanted to follow up a little. Mm -hmm. You know, um, stepping out of the legal role and into the parent role, I've got three sons. Um, you know, I, I just want to make sure we're all not being naive and not um, here as well. Parental responsibility is huge in this regard. Um, the onus is on us. Um, yes, we need to put, uh, I think, some best practices mm -hmm. industry-wide are, are totally, I completely support it um, to facilitate that. But, you know, if kids want to get something and you say no, they're going to figure out a way around it. I mean, that's, you know, that's the reality of the situation. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to figure out, and again, industry-wide best practice is completely supportive of, but let's not be naive to the fact that if somebody wants something and you say no, they're going to still do it. Well, what we're learning is yeah. parent, there are a lot of kids out there that their parents can't reach. Yeah. There are high-risk teenagers mm -hmm. that this is what we're finding in the social networking space, and this will be true with phones, too. And so what the industry can do, and possibly legislation, I don't know, um, but we can, we can work to reach the high-risk kids through organizations that understand behavioral risks. And I think some of the philanthropic money needs to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. So, so um, Heidi, your, your question uh, about whether or not uh, free ad-supported services, for example, um, are going to change the landscape. Free ad-supported services are coming. I mean, our, our service is two ninety nine a month. The, the Helio service, I believe, is, is free as part of, of the core service, and frankly, our service will likely be free or, or bundled in with data services, some of the other providers, as, as we go forward as well. Either the economics will either be it's, it's driving usage, it's driving people to get data plans, it's driving people to stay with it one network and not churn to another. And as, as I think everybody anticipates, someday these things will be ad-supported, whether it's push or pull, it may be a little McDonald's logo on a map so you can find McDonald's and McDonald's has paid for that, or it may well be push couponing, but obviously only if people have asked for it um, when somebody walks past a Starbucks. None of those things should change the fact that um, the services need to respect the safety and privacy of the consumers. And, and again, I don't really worry about the wireless industry. I just finished authoring the, the safety chapter on the LBS best practices for the CTIA working group, and it's real conservative, um, and it should be, and I know the wireless operators fairly well, and it, that's not going to change. The challenge is that more and more location technologies are are coming of, of available and there are some folks and I, I know the folks at Skyhook for example have, have done a really good job with um, with getting location access and I think have, have launched responsible services but they have competitors and who knows how responsible they'll be so that that is that is my my largest concern mm -hmm. frankly thank you very very interesting I think we could have probably gone on for another hour um, as you can see, it's a very interesting discussion, but some of these points will be touched on a little bit more later. Do we have five minutes for Q&A? Two, okay, two minutes for Q&A. So does anybody have any questions? The gentleman there. I'm sorry. Hello? Yes. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, and I could be misunderstanding, but I'm, I'm sort of worried about the following dichotomy, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I worry about the dichotomy between um, the folks that are participating in this service either you know know where you are, or know that you're cloaking. Okay, so they know that you they know that you shut off your, your tracking. I worry about that for a few reasons. One, a very unfortunate prevalence of domestic violence in the United States. Mm -hmm. Two, imagine a situation where law enforcement are in a court and you say, well, look, the robbery occurred at 3 p.m. This person was over here. They're cloaking at at, at 2:59. They're back online at 3:17. I mean. It, you know, it, is there a way for you to fake it? And, you know, what are the ethical repercussions of, of that? Are you direct? Is this for Mark or Jeremy? I'm sorry, it's or, for either Mark or okay. Jeremy. It's a, it's a very interesting question, actually. One of the things that um, we determined when we put our service in place was when somebody decided to go off the map, and we've made it incredibly easy. You can, you can turn yourself off or on in terms of your ability to be seen at any time for any individual. So I can be on the map for Evan and off the map for Tom. We, one of the things we do not do is tell Tom that you just turned yourself off. 
right? We don't want 17-year-olds feeling like, uh, you know what, there's some social stigma associated with taking myself off the map. There is going to be an issue here, though, which is that the, the social mores around how this works are going to have to develop. There's a really interesting article in the Wall Street Journal that was written after we launched about this. When people first got cell phones, if you called somebody's cell phone and they didn't answer, you know, were you insulted? Why isn't this person answering the phone? Well, now we all know that sometimes you don't answer the phone because you're in a meeting, or sometimes you don't answer the phone because, frankly, you're too busy. And the mores around what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable usage of that new technology took some time to develop. The same thing is going to have to happen around services like this. Uh, your, your, second, your second question, which was about sort of the, the law enforcement point, um, I mean, from our, from our perspective, um, we like to think that there's no location, if, if law enforcement needs to know where somebody is right now, um, they can get that actually already through E911 and E911 and the, and the wireless operators and they don't need a service like Loop. If they want to know where somebody was three weeks ago, we don't actually keep that information because frankly the privacy concerns with that in our opinion outweigh some of, some of the potential public safety benefit of having historical tracking location information on people. But that's a, there's a really interesting balance there, and actually I don't know if we'll have time to get into this, and probably more interesting to get into this after Jim Dempsey speaks, but th there, there are certain things that we do keep. So we keep, when you choose to become friends with somebody, we keep that interaction. When you choose to sign up for the service, we keep that interaction. For that matter, if you invite somebody and then um, they don't accept it, we keep that interaction. What we don't keep is all of your, the breadcrumbs of your life because frankly the, the, the risk of some sort of social hack or social engineering to get at that information and making that public is just too great. So there's, there's a really interesting balance that has to go on there for providers. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think um, when you talk about cloaking and turning out <coughs> friends, you're not cloaking from the, you know, the police or you're not, you can't cloak from that. Right. I mean, you just, you can't. Um, people need to be able to, you know, again, E911, all this is, it's always on. Right. We just choose to not let other people see where you're at. Right. A criminal who really wants to cloak from the FBI probably should not be carrying a cell phone around. Yeah. Especially not one that has the loop Jeep, service on well, it. Or, <laughs> or, you know, or just you, any of them. Yeah, it's a great GPS, alibi, though, a GPS chip in it. somebody walking around yeah. with it somewhere else. Yeah. Um, do we have time for one more or, or no? Uh, I, th I thought there was one in the front row. Okay, this, this will have to be the last, but we'll... Everyone will yeah. be available during the break, too. Right. So, uh, I was just wondering with regards to cloaking, um, as it pertains to stalkers and kids and predation, uh, if you're keeping the information um, of individuals that are trying to reach somebody and maybe the kid then um, accepts the call not knowing, well, you're keeping that. So aren't you keeping those lines open? And then, and then on the flip side of that, for somebody who doesn't want to talk to somebody, would that be admissible in court as it pertains to like a restraining order um, situation? Hmm. Uh, on, on the latter half, I, I don't actually know. Um, I, I think that if somebody, if somebody has a restraining order against somebody else and they reach out to them with a, in any way, with a phone call or an email or on a social network, um, on MySpace or Facebook, or for that matter, through a social mapping service, I suspect any of those um, are violations of, of court orders, but I, I couldn't tell you the details there. I, it doesn't feel like it's any different than sending an email to that person or sending an IM to that person or calling that person. Um, that's, that's the lay person's And certainly law reaction. enforcement is using that as evidence, what's happening on the social networks already, so I imagine they will. In, on the cell phones. Your, I'm sorry, your question is whether the fact that someone cloaked themselves could be disclosed to law enforcement? Yes. I, I, I think generally the answer would be no. I mean, if law enforcement uh, serves a subpoena, for example, under ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, that, you know, they're only, you're, the carriers are only allowed to turn over certain pieces of information, which are called subscriber records. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't think that would be normally something that would be, that would be disclosed. But you know, to, to, to be honest with you, I don't know that we keep specific yeah. information on time of cloaking and yeah. where they cloaked and all this other fun stuff. Um, again, it's a, it's a, you don't need to cloak with our service. I mean, you, you actually have to affirmatively say, right. update my location. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, 
I do think that if that individual wanted to share that information and that individual and that information was retained, certainly we would be disclosing that. Well, I, I'm particularly concerned about um, those kids that are high-risk kids that agree to meet somebody that they've never met in the real world, you know, an online person, uh, who then grooms them, and then they find that they're in trouble, um, and they can't get out of that situation, uh, that situation, because it's very dangerous. I mean, now kids can upload videos, photos, whatever. They can be tricked into what they think are acceptable, okay pictures of themselves, but in fact they're inappropriate and they can be morphed and sold and all those different things that everybody knows about these days that are in the space. And so it's very dangerous. So while I embrace the technology, I think we also have to be very cognizant of uh, the effects of the technology and how it can put kids at a greater risk. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, I, I completely understand your concern. Um, but I don't necessarily think there's anything different than th with this than with if you're at home and you say this is where I'm going to be, I'll meet you over here via email. There's actually a, an advantage to this is that it's got this, these three buttons called 911 that you can press when you do get into trouble and somebody can locate you and get you out of that trouble. Um, there's, you know, the way that we designed this was to be just like if you're at home doing an email, email exchange with somebody, so you have to affirmatively say something. If you are a high-risk kid and get yourself into trouble, you know, you, you, you know, you're, you're getting yourself into trouble either at home and meeting somebody out or, you know, you're beaming your location and then they come meet you there, you know, at least you have 911 to push and the police can get there as soon as possible and locate you. But to, to your point, I mean, it is, it is clear that um, for services like ours, being aware of the prevalence, frankly, of predators and doing everything possible to make it very, very difficult for them to reach out to kids, to try to groom kids, and, and probably even more importantly, making sure that the predators are not anonymous is incredibly important. And that's actually one of the huge advantages. We'll talk more about this in best practices, but one of the huge advantages we have over the internet-based services. On the internet that nobody knows you're a dog, on the internet nobody knows you're a creep. Um, with a handset, you can verify if I want to have go online at 650-555-1212 and, and, and use Looped, I, we verify that you are in fact in possession of that handset and that you have the pin that will, that will start this Sprint phone. And so I'm no longer anonymous. And frankly, if I'm a creep, it's probably then not going to be the thing that I'm right. going to use. Yeah, and I've got his social. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. I can tell you. I can tell you where he lives. I can tell you his social security so, number. Right, I can right. tell you all sorts of. So in some, there's, there are much better authentication mechanisms in place when you're dealing with a wireless environment. And then we'll wrap it up with that. Yeah, Heidi and panel. I want to thank the panel. Um, <laughs>